Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Great. We like to start off by just acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're on, as well as the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on to collectively learn uh, for our liberation and sovereignty. So I want to thank you once again and just ask you to introduce yourself to our viewers and listeners. Sure. Um, thank you very much. So my name is Michael Braithwaite. I've had uh, the good fortune of working in the social, social services sector for the last 30 years, many years with the YMCA, and, and then in the last 13, I've worked in the area of housing, homelessness, poverty reduction, and uh, just had the good fortune of working with, with some amazing people doing some life-changing stuff. That's great. So can you tell us a bit about the origin of your work and how you guys are disrupting multiple ecosystems in Canada? Yeah, yeah. So I'll talk a little bit. I mean, Blue Door as an organization has been around for 41 years, so a long time. Um, and when it first started, it primarily was focused on emergency shelters, so kind of reacting to a problem that was already in, in process, right? And we did that for a long time. We did it well, and a lot of lives were really changed, saved, moving forward. But a few years back, there was a, the realization that we could do more. If we're just always reacting to things, we never could put an end to them, right? So you know, how do you work upstream? How do you get out in front of it? How do you help people before it becomes a major chronic issue, a chronic homelessness? Um, and it's realizing that emergency housing isn't the only solution when people have housing needs, right? For some people, it's strictly economic, right? So if we can help them find meaningful, well-paying employment, they won't fall into homelessness. If uh, we can help them actually find housing, and, and it might even be market rent. They just can't do that. Uh, it might stop them from going into emergency housing. Um, and, and so it, it's taking a variety of different um, paths and how you address a problem too. So how, how you look at it. You know, if you work a little more upstream and think of how do we stop this from happening before it even starts? And we've done some of that work uh, through our programs. And not only that, is that it doesn't end also when you, get someone into housing. So if you look at it in three pieces, preventative, you're reacting kind of with emergency and then aftercare, right? We always put all our money in the middle. We reacted, right? That was it. Um, and now we have to try and take some of that and put it into preventing. Uh, and also, but aftercare, once you put someone into housing, how do you help them create community, right? Because it's not just put the four walls and a roof. How do you make sure they're looking after themselves and their health care? Uh, and so that that housing doesn't fall apart and they end up sliding back into emergency housing, right? So we kind of look at that full circle approach to it. How, when someone comes into homelessness as well, what we were finding is that mentally and physically their health, uh, many uh, vulnerable people don't have access to health care. Um, they might have lost their uh, health card. They may never have had a health card um, and they don't have links to a family doctor. And when you are spending time living on the street, uh, what it does to your physical and mental health, right? And, and so coming into uh, actual housing, we needed to address that as well. If, if to stabilize them, we need to work through that. We need to take a look at the trauma and take a trauma-informed approach. Um, but if we can stabilize their health, they'll be more likely to be able to attain housing moving forward. So it, it's health, uh, housing is health, health is housing. Um, all these things that that overlap and, and link them. And we've done a lot of that. We've got a uh, health center within one of our programs. And, and what that, when you think about it in two ways, not only are you changing lives, you're actually saving dollars as well. Because what would happen in the past if, let's say you came forward and you said, my, my arm hurts, I'm having a lot of pain. Our only option then was to call 911. So when you do that, every time you do that, Right, because what if I say shake it off, and then something happens to you, and, and had you gone to the hospital? So we, we, you know, we don't want to take that risk. You call nine one one, you get police, ambulance, fire, all get dispersed, and and so you, this is happening all the time. And not only is that a good use of resources, so they might come and say, "No, oh, you're good," you know, uh, take an aspirin, or they might say, "We need to transport you to the hospital, get it checked out." Um, but just in in bringing in a nurse to blue door we cut down on those calls by 50 percent, right because they could walk across and say my arm hurts and let's take a look at it problem solved 
right? So you're you're also not putting through the, the trauma of getting an ambulance, going to the hospital, going through that whole process, which also is very expensive, right? So every time you do those calls and you're dispersing those people, it's a lot of money. So not only does reducing poverty, uh, any homelessness, uh, getting people proper health care save lives, economically, it saves a lot of dollars too. For sure. It sounds like uh, you guys have taken a real holistic approach to the problem now uh, when you talk about the aftercare support and being more uh, proactive. That's amazing, especially being able to cut down those calls by 50 percent just by having someone to triage right there is uh, outstanding. So I appreciate you giving us that background. Can you articulate what the Blue Door mission and vision is right now? Well, I'm going to do my uh, organization disservice, so I, I would verbatim off. Really, the, the the mission is around ending homelessness, right? It's making sure everyone has a safe place to call home. That's more of the vision. And the mission about how we go about doing that, we do that through the core pillars of housing, health, and meaningful and well-paying employment, right? And, and most of what we do kind of focuses on those three things and falls within those three pillars to get uh, to the place where everyone has a safe place to call home. Absolutely. I love that. So how important is philanthropic innovation uh, to you and the work that you do? Well, I'd say it's extremely, extremely important, right? I think if we, uh, too often in, in our sector, we're very dependent on government and, and government plays a huge role. Don't get me wrong. There's responsibility in there for, you know, uh, to help people realize that human right of housing. Um, but governments change, priorities change right, with different governments, um, but the need still remains. So I think that coming up with new sources of revenue and income from foundations and others and trying to apply for those funds and being creative around it is huge. If we're not just going to, I mean, we, we right now we can't afford just to sustain what we have. We have to grow and add things because the problem's getting worse, right? So uh, it plays a huge role. And, and so when I came into Blue Door four years ago, we were 90% uh, funded by one funder. So if that funder changes course, we're done. Like that's it, right? We're so dependent on, and now, uh, and and we we did very little fundraising, and now we're about seventy percent government, thirty percent fundraising, and that continues to grow. We also have a program. We have a construction company with a social purpose that brings in revenue. So we actually have our own revenue generator. So at some point in the future, if we grow that, maybe the need for government funding will be less and less and less. And what that means and what I love about it, uh, Bless, is that um, if we need something, we just do it. We don't have to cross our fingers and, and, and hope that there'll be a grant or that something will happen or that this government will come in and do X. We can just say, you know what? We need to add a worker. We need to add a doctor. We need to, we actually, let's purchase that house over there. Let's do that and keep it affordable in perpetuity, right? Um, and allows us to do that. But yeah, the grant piece, the fundraising, being innovative around how we, we do that, uh, how we generate revenue is, is crucial to uh, supporting uh, our most vulnerable populations. That's amazing. Uh, being able to pivot and do that obviously is uh, a lot more empowering and you can be more stable going into the future. Uh, thank you for sharing. What inspires you most about the current model at Blue Door? I get inspired by, uh, you mentioned uh, a colleague that we both have, uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Case, right? Um, she's an example of, I get inspired by brilliant young people in this. Uh, I have to face the music. I've got about 10 years left. I'm done, right? So as a change maker, I'll do my best, but it's individuals like yourself and Cheryl and others. Uh, and there's a lot of them at Blue Door is what I'm saying is that I love seeing new people come in who really want to change things and won't accept anything less uh, and are very smart, very driven, um, very diverse. It's very cool to see. And, and in my job at this stage is to try and empower, give them the tools and get out of their way um, and, and and help them get there. Right. Um, I was at a, a conference with, and Cheryl was there and I said, what do you think? She said, well, how come everyone here other than myself is like over 50, right? Like, and it's just nothing wrong with it. But if you're talking about this whole conference is focused around change, you've got to bring in young leaders and give them the opportunity. And I said, you're hundred percent right. Like I didn't even notice I was in my own kind of world because I was among the 50 year olds, but, uh, 
but she was right. And I think that's what inspires me is when I see young leaders, young people who uh, are standing up and making making things happen. And that's pretty cool uh, in this field. And I think that's what, why I also know this is not like, it could be um, when you get up every day and read the news right around the world, it's pretty depressing stuff, right? There's not a lot of optimism there, but I draw my optimism from the young leaders who, who I think we're in good hands. Good things are, are happening and will continue to happen. Absolutely. Uh, so what challenges or barriers do you face in your work and how are you working to overcome them? So the biggest challenge, and, and it's become uh, more of a issue over the past few years is, is around deeply affordable housing. Part of the show, when I say affordable housing, uh, I have to clarify what that means, right? Because there's different definitions. Like the, the government definition of affordable housing is usually 80% of mid-market rent, which is not affordable to most people that we work with, right? So I say deeply affordable. The one that most people in the sector use would be 30% of someone's income should go towards housing. So if that income is only $700 a month, it should be 30% of that, right? To For that to happen. Now, in saying that, average rents in Toronto are about $2,000 a month for a one-bedroom apartment. I remember the Globe and Mail said you need about an income of $100,000 a year to afford to live in Toronto in a one-bedroom apartment, right? That's one bedroom. We're not talking luxury, a six-figure salary. Well, 15% of people in Ontario receive Ontario Works, or Social Assistance, or ODSP, right, Disability Pension, uh, which is, say, $720 or $1,300 a month. Uh, so right away, the gap is huge, right? So there's these huge gaps um, the people being able to afford housing and you can't even get a room. So what happens is they get into situations, uh, precarious housing around where you're, you're sharing a room, you're, sh you're, you're renting a couch at someone's house. Uh, there's way too many people you know, with one bathroom and they're, they're doing what they, they can to survive, right? Um, and it's very, very tough. You're also seeing uh, people that could in the past afford the housing that was there now being pushed into. So we're seeing more and more people working full time that are going into emergency housing. Now, the trouble is they don't want to be in a shelter because they don't need all the support services, right? They simply can't afford rent, but they don't have options because there's not affordable housing out there, right? So if they could actually, you know, if we had more affordable housing options, they would not be in a shelter. That would open up the shelter spaces for people who really need that wraparound support, the 24 seven shelter is really expensive too, right? Like so, so because it's twenty four seven, and and you know you have a lot of staffing there and food needs and that kind of thing, opposed to just affordable housing where you might have some supports, but it's semi independent living, right? And that's what a lot of people need, but they don't have an option, so that option's not there. So there's a lot of challenges around how do we meet this? Uh, Canada used to build tens of thousands of units of social housing up until. Uh, the early 90s, and then the federal government said, no, I think, you know, we can lean more on the private sector. We don't need to do this anymore. And that was wrong, right? Because now we find ourselves, uh, the government saying, hey, we need to build an additional on top of whatever we normally build, 3.5 million homes by 2030 to meet the need of Canadians. So that's the challenge. Like we have this huge gap in affordable housing. What are we going to do? How are we going to do that? Um, and I think, you know, some of the challenges around that are there's a few things. Yes, we need to build more. Um, and is, we've got to build more affordable housing that's out there. We have to empower nonprofits and give them the tools so nonprofits can do that work. The other piece we forget about is we also have to maintain the current supply. <clears throat> and you see that. You read stories about people living in Toronto community housing, ceilings falling in, doing that. We have to repair what we have and keep it in good condition so people can live with dignity. But we also are losing a lot of homes to crumbling infrastructure to private market selling, fixing up and boosting the rents. So that affordable housing stock is dwindling. We have less affordable housing now than we did in 2015, despite having a national housing strategy and all these things happening, right? Because it's for every new build you have, you're losing, say, 10 to 15 to crumbling infrastructure in the private sector. So we have to do things like land trust, right? Where a land trust will say, we're going to get these houses, we're going to have them donate, we're going to buy them, we're going to keep them in this trust, where in perpetuity, forever, they will remain affordable. The asset always remains in the trust. Others might operate them, 
might be a blue door operating or Fred Victor or others operating, but the actual asset doesn't belong to them, but it always remains in the trust and remains affordable. Right. So, so there, there's big challenges around that. Um, and the other challenge is we can't really have a conversation around ending homelessness, preventing homelessness. If we don't talk about incomes, right. I mean, said, you know, the, the need for income and that gap there, uh, the lowest uh, food banks right now are at the highest level they've ever been. It's crazy. And they're seeing more working people. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, it's after paying for housing, families using food banks have uh, $6 left over at the end of the day. And if you're black or indigenous, you'll have $4 left over. Right. Uh, is what are you going to do? Like, what do you do with that? That's, that's, we're talking about food, transportation, like everything you, you can't, you know, it's hard to buy coffee sometimes for that. Right. And never mind. So, so we have to have conversations around how do we get better income supports for Canadians um, in need. And we saw one of the silver linings of the pandemic was serve. What a great experiment that was like, it, it was an accidental experiment in basic income. Cause when people had $2,000 a month to get by core housing need went down, food bank usage was really low Right? When people have the money they need, they don't rely on food banks. Food banks will tell you, the answer is not more food. We love that people are giving food. That's wonderful. But the answer is affordable housing and greater incomes, and they can afford their own food. Right, That's now how you're going to end food bank usage. Once again, uh, such a holistic approach to the whole situation. So really appreciate your insights. Now, I know you touched on um, that specific issue right now, but do you have a key set of priorities that you're working on right now that you'd like to highlight? We're always solution focused, right? At Blue Door, like I think too often in the sector, we get around a table and we're really great at pointing out what's not working, but we need to bring solutions to the table. One of the things that we're doing at Blue Door, and I, so let me preface this by saying I have failed a lot and I've been a part of the problem a lot, not on purpose, but, you know, in trying best intentions still. And I say that for many years, I would be a part of running employment programs that had really good intentions, but it actually just um, extended the cycle of poverty, right? Because we were putting people in jobs that pay the minimum wages that they hated that had awful hours because, you know, any job will... And they're saying, I hate this job. It's not pulling me out of poverty. My life hasn't changed. You know, so it was failure. And I, you set me up for a failure, which I didn't need. I've had enough failure in my life, right? So there's that. Um, I've been a part of uh, housing programs where we didn't understand community. So we'd be like, job done. Like we found someone, affordable housing. Great. Good luck. And what happens is I was in a shelter where I had 35 buddies. Every day I saw them. They became my family, my community. The staff cared and wanted to know how I was doing and were looking after me. There's food. And he put me in housing, which is wonderful, that I could afford. None of that's there. I don't know anyone in this community. I have no connection. No one cares about me. No one cares what I eat or I don't. No one's asking me how I'm doing. And so we, we didn't realize that community, it's not just about housing. It's about developing true communities uh, involving people in aftercare and that kind of thing. So we learn each time we do that. So the innovation is from there. We started a program at Blue Door, uh, based on another program in Toronto, building up, and they based it on purpose construction out of Manitoba. But it's pretty cool that one of the challenges we have right now in building the housing we need across the country is we actually don't have the workforce to build the housing we need because they're retiring really quick. For the longest time, people have almost looked down on the trades. If you came into high school and said, I'm going to go in construction, oh, I guess you couldn't make it at college or university. Like, no. I'm really good at this. This is a skill. It's a different kind of education, right? And so because of that, we don't have a lot of people that went into the trades. People are retiring. There's a gap. Uh, so we started a construction social enterprise called Construct at Blue Door, Division of Blue Door. So there's two pieces to it. There's a training program, paid. You come into it. You spend eight weeks. We work with Luna 506. You get some certifications through the union. Um, you learn about the trades, you get some on-site, you go to some on-site things that, that are construction part of construct. There's, there's a construction company. They're doing real construction. Experts are doing that work. And then the participants come, hang out on the site, say, I like this. Now I have work site experience. I could do that. It's pre-apprenticeship training. And at the end of eight weeks, and also during those eight weeks, they're getting rent support, transportation support, child care support, mental health supports, addiction supports, any supports they need are wrapped around them for success. Um, and at the end of that, 
if they want to go into a trade, there's a bunch of trades, that's what they do. And 80% of people do. And then they get paid really well. They make a living wage out of the gate. And it's meaningful work. I mean, I, I can't point at somebody and say, look what I did. But they can. They drive by a building and say, I built that. I did the rebar there. I did the concrete there. I did. I demolished this so this could go. It's pretty cool, right? So it's, it's you know, it's, mean, it's meaningful work. It's well-paying. And it's homelessness prevention. Because if I could get the money I need, my homelessness stand might be short or never happen, right? So that's the kind of thinking. And here's the other piece out of that is that every time we do a construction job, like any other contractor, that money comes back in to solve problems of homelessness and staffing. What I mentioned before, it's a revenue stream that's not in the back of taxpayers that we control. And isn't it cool that we're preventing homelessness, but we could actually be building housing to also prevent homelessness, you know, and, and many is, is multiple wins. So it's that kind of innovative thinking that we continue to push on, and we're expanding that program. I've now gone into Durham, Peel, and are working with the federal government to say, you know, can we do five of these across the country? Not really us, but give the knowledge, the knowledge transfer to organizations to do that so you grow the impact. Uh, and we focus on that. We're focused on growing our health care piece uh, that we're doing and also filling the gaps. Uh, there's two surveys in New York region that showed that 2S LGBTQ plus youth didn't feel safe in the emergency spots that were available. Said, we just don't. You know, we have different needs. You train your staff, but then you get new staff. And also the other clients in there might be homophobic or transphobic. or So I don't feel safe. And I have medical needs that maybe are not understood. So we, you know, rolled the dice and got it. I say that because we didn't have funding. And we created a home called Inclusion, like an in, I-N-N, -N, an inclusion, an inclusion house. It's for 2S, LGBTQ plus youth, uh, semi-independent, truly affordable living for up to three years with wraparound supports. So we look at the gaps, we fill them. We did the same for senior men. We've done work with families. Um, and so it's always, where are the gaps and how can we step up to meet them? And, you know, and, and one of the things I was proud of is a couple of years ago, Nama Rez came into York region because you know, there's uh, Indigenous people experiencing homelessness in York region, uh, but it should be Indigenous-led. Any solution to it should be Indigenous-led. It shouldn't be me or Blue Door. So instead of us, you know, we actually worked with Amarez to say, hey, let's find some funding. Now, ultimately, um, the tough part around that was they had a real tough time finding staff, Indigenous staff in York region to do the work. So I, they ultimately weren't able to do they did it for a while and weren't able to continue. But those kinds of, that's the thought process to get, you know, to share with you of, we're always thinking of how do we fill the gaps? How are the gaps changing? Right now, when you look at uh, the number of refugees who are coming in, who are facing homelessness, so it's changed. And those needs are different than say, what we were facing a couple of years ago. And so my staff need different training. Our staff need different supports from the legal community because a lot of it's around the legalities. How do I work through these forums? How do I work? How do I do this? Um, but how do we get people who really want to work and get housed real quick? How do we make that happen for them? So we're, we're working through that as well. Um, and, and I love these challenges, but um, it is really always being able to pivot quickly to serve the needs of the people uh, that need your services most. Yeah, it's so necessary and not everyone can uh, keep up with those changes. So we definitely uh, uh, reply your remarkable work in being able to do that. Um, I'm anxious to hear how you feel about the future of impact investing and social finance in Canada. Yeah, I mean, I think the current model is broken, right? It's not working. And I think that I'm encouraged um, around social financing, impact investing. I love um, and, and, you know, when someone gives you a dollar, let's say someone, let's say I said, bless, I'm going to give $20 to Blue Door. The question that you should probably too often is, well, how much of that $20 is going to go direct to the, not to overhead, not to, that shouldn't be the question. Cause why does that even matter if the impact is awesome? If I spent 19 of the $20 on overhead, but 3000 people get off the streets because that, well, who okay, Yeah, great. Let's measure impact, not that. Because if I'm not spending any money on marketing and innovation, doing all those things, then that that's never going to grow. It's going to be the same thing, right? But it's changing that that mindset. 
So I think impact matters. And when you invest, invest in impact, not in, you know, uh, how much of that dollar is going to go to and, and uh, a lot of, I, I saw um, there's a, a movie that was out recently called uncharitable and it was talking about really how the charitable sector is almost in prison in the sense that we expect it to act as a business and do the same things as business without the same tools right we're going to underpay you um, we're, we're, you're not going to allow, be allowed to spend on marketing and all the different things that you would do to grow your business in the private sector in the public or sorry in the uh, profit sector but we want the same results. And, and so why would anyone want to do where, and, you know, and, and we want, this is a pretty housing, homelessness, poverty, you know, these are pretty complex issues. If you want the best of the best working on it, you know, you spend, uh, you know, young people spend a fortune on education. Do you really like, should they have to come out of school and not be paid really well to solve? Those are the people you want working on those complex problems, but they're not going to, unless, you know, you get a few uh, people that might, uh, you know, ignore the the dollars they could make in, in the, the for profit. Um, so, so social finance and impact investment will play a huge part in the future of ending this because we can't. What we're doing is not working. It's the same old systems of let's just raise a few dollars and depend on government isn't solving it. We have to be creative. We have to think differently, and, and that doesn't happen if you're not creative around the financial pieces of of doing this. Um, and 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 yeah, so to me, I think it's a, it's an exciting time. Yes, there's big challenges, but you know, if the pandemic showed us anything, this sector can actually mobilize pretty quick, right? So when the first message was like, "Stay safe, stay home," and and 235,000 Canadians don't have a safe place to call home, they put the government put a ton of resources into hotels and housing people and getting, and we house thousands of people across the country real quick. So we can't do it, political will, dollars. But it also has to make economic sense so we don't bankrupt the country and bad things happen. Yes, it's so, so true. You touch on so many valid points. I've always said it's, uh, I call it digital evangelism. So, you know, you put into, like you said, fundraising and everything like that. But as you said, there's innovative ways and like your online presence really matters. So, yeah, you have to put a budget towards that. It's a uh, digital evangelism. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, of the importance. There, there's there's great examples of that where, you know, in, in this movie it was mostly American where, you know, they went out and they paid a, a you know a non they hired someone and paid them more and gave them that leeway and they took a you know three million dollar organization serving uh, women and made it into a a hundred and thirty million dollar organization serving way more women having greater impact. But they had to have that kind of faith and and change that kind of thinking around, you know how uh, nonprofits and charities work, right? It it is unfair to and and the, how the media will spin something to say, you know these dollars. So let you know, let's say for example, if you know you write a grant, you get a million dollars. Well, normally your overhead you try to put in about fifteen percent, right? So that's under fifty thousand. But if the headline reads, you know, charity takes one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of, well, let's put it into context. That's fifteen percent of that. You can't if you're not doing accounting and risk management, insurance, and all the legal pieces. You can't do any of the sort. Like there is a cost to doing that business and marketing and doing that. So, so, but I think it's what the headlines read, and then people then look down and say, oh, I don't want to give to that charity anymore. You know, like. You know, they're they're rich or they're wealthy. Well, no, they're delivering that, right? It becomes a, a scandal that's not a scandal. Yeah, I, it's so beautifully said. I've always said that. I said, don't talk to me in dollars, talk to me in percentages. And that's how I've always explained it. Um, you know, you you won't get, you know, a, a big reaction out of me when you mention the dollars because it, it depends on the percentage of the budget, yeah. right? If, if we can agree on a percentage of the budget, yeah, it, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what that pastor is being paid or what that organization is putting yeah. to the overhead costs. It's about the deliverable. So I think you, that was very well said. Thank you for those uh, highlights. Um, if you could sum up what your ultimate goal is with Blue Door, uh, what does success look like for you and your colleagues? Could you paint that picture for us? Yeah, I mean, it sounds way too simple, but like success is enough affordable housing and services, wraparound services, so everyone has a safe place to call home. And not just 
in York region or Toronto. This is across Canada, right? In our country, we live in a very, very wealthy country. There's no, our country has now realized housing is a human right, or, or we've stated that, we've legislated that, but now we have to put action to words. So what does that mean? If I want to actually realize my right to housing, how do I make that happen? And we've got to make that happen. And that's, you know, my vision, my hope uh, for the future for Blue Door too, is that we take very measurable action in making that happen with things like a land trust where we're creating housing in perpetuity affordable forever. And we keep growing that and using those assets and, the, and even that to leverage more assets, you know, sell four houses to buy a 40 unit apartment and sell that 40 units to buy a 200 unit. And you keep building that. So you have more and more and more, and you're being very savvy and business-like to have greater impact. Right. So the, the end goal of, uh, ending homelessness in a sense. When we say ending homelessness, someone will always, well, there's that guy still. Yes, but if that person wants a bed in services, they are readily available rather than I'm calling 311 and they're saying not tonight, right? That's what success looks like to me. And it also, I think success for Blue Door, I would love you know, to have this conversation five years from now where I'm telling you we're 10% government, 90% self-funded. I love that. Um, do you have any <coughs> thoughts or calls to action for our community? So I saw, I'm always fascinated by business stories of that, that were really small and had these global impacts, right? So you take Blackberry, for example, I watched this Blackberry, the Blackberry movie the other night. And the fact that this tiny company in Waterloo, Ontario, which is really small, was at one point controlled 45% of the world's cell phone market, right? Like 45%. And now they control zero, right? So it's a success and failure and, and, and that. But there's a line in that that I love because I, I talk about it often where the co-CEOs are kind of arguing and the guy wants to, he said, you know, do up a prototype of the the BlackBerry. And he says, but I I, I, I'm, I, won't, I won't be able to do that. I need it to be perfect. And he says, have you ever heard perfect is the enemy of good? The response to that from the tech guy says, have you ever heard that uh, good enough is the enemy of humanity? And I love that because when it comes to the work that I do, quite often we work, for, a lot of people work from a good enough philosophy, right? So example, uh, someone's experiencing homelessness. Hey, we should get them a sleeping bag and a tent and, we, and then we'll, you know, a couple of granola bars and then we're, we're you know, great job. Right. And that's the good enough. They didn't die tonight. They didn't die tonight. Should, tonight should not be the bar. That good enough. We saved them for another night. Well, listen, I'm still part. We run uh, a seasonal program out of the cold. And and the woman who runs it, Rahana, is incredible. She's been doing it for 20 years. They've saved thousands of lives, changed lives. They supported people. But if you ask her, homelessness isn't seasonal. <laughs> what, uh, at the end of May, I'm like, so what happens now? I don't know, you know, like they, they, so, so it doesn't make sense. It's, it's driven by dollars, but it's that good enough, right? Where we always say, oh, it's good enough. And so good enough is the enemy of humanity. We have to get past good enough uh, and be great and have people live in dignified housing and ask yourself the question, if that was your mother, if that was your brother, if that was your spouse, would that be good enough for them? And, and most of the time the answer would be no, that it shouldn't be good enough for anyone. Right, because that's someone's brother, spouse, grandmother, family member. Everyone has some type of family, right? So, uh, good enough is the enemy of humanity, um, and I think I, I would that would that really stayed with me because I, I think we we really have to push past doing good enough in this country, and we can. Absolutely. I don't think I could have said it better myself. I think those are, are great parting words. So thank you so much uh, for all of your insights, the remarkable work that you're doing. We really applaud your leadership, Mike. Well, I throw that right back at you. Thanks for the inspiration. Thanks for all you're doing and continue to do. Uh, you're, you're the change maker that's going to make things uh, really happen. And it's appreciated. I appreciate those sentiments. 
And uh, we just want to close uh, the way that we started off by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands that we're on, as well as our ancestors who toiled without compassion or compensation and the elders whose shoulders we continue to stand on as we continue to build and share and learn together for our collective liberation. So once again, thank you so much for taking the time, Mike, to be here. And thank you to our viewers and listeners. Thank you.